So this evening, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Berin Golanu. Dr. Golanu's research interests include Ottoman and Turkish modern art and visual culture, art and environmentalism in developing Asian countries, and photographic histories of the Middle East. She's currently working on a book entitled People's Gardens, Structuring Public Leisure Space in the Late Ottoman Empire, which traces the establishment of European style public parks in key Ottoman cities during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. She has lectured at museums and universities around the world and is currently a clinical assistant professor of art history and visual studies in the Department of Art at SUNY Buffalo. So Dr. Golanu, welcome to Hartwick, virtually speaking. And thank you for being part of our series this fall. So I will turn it over to you now. Thanks so much, Doug. Yeah, I wanna thank the Art and Art History Department at Hartwick College, in particular you, Stephanie Rosine and Leah Frankel for inviting me. It's really great to be here. And I also wanna thank everyone who has taken time out of their schedule to join us here today, tonight. So thanks for being here, guys. Today, I'm going to present an excerpt from my research on the first European style parks or people gar people's gardens, Millet Bahçeleri, that were built in the late Ottoman Empire. And maybe I should just go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so there we go. Can everyone see that okay? So I look at how these new European style parks were designed to control public visibility and shape public behavior. And I look at uh, their establishment first in the 1870s and I track them through the 1930s after the founding of the Turkish Republic. These new public gardens were modeled after the urban parks that were being established in European urban centers, such as London, Paris, and Berlin in the early to mid 19th century. And I ask how Istanbul's new leisure spaces are both a symptom and a cause of the modernizing changes that Ottoman society and later Turkish society were going through during this time of tremendous transition and modernization. So close to a dozen of these new people's gardens, uh, and they were referred to as people's gardens first. The word park would enter the vocabulary much later, okay? They were built across Istanbul from the 1870s through the final years of the reign of the Ottoman Empire. And there are uh, close to 12 of them in different neighborhoods of Istanbul. Dozens more were built in other major cities across the empire, in cities across the Mediterranean from the Balkans to North Africa. Some of these sites, such as the Gülhane Public Garden, uh, you see a postcard view of the Gülhane Public Garden here, are still extant and they're still very popular uh, as as urban parks today in Istanbul. Others, however, have been drastically transformed. Some of them have disappeared altogether. The chronology that I focus on in my research not only covers the fall of the empire, but also the initial years of the Turkish Republic, which you know, just want to tell those students who are not familiar with the fall of the empire and the, the year in which the Turkish Republic was founded, the Ottoman Empire basically lost the First World War and came to an end um, at the end of the First World War, and the Turkish Republic was born a few years later in 1923, with Mustafa Kemal Pasha being the military leader who um, was victorious in the Turkish War of Independence against the invading Allied powers, and then, then uh, progressed to become the first president of the nation and founded the Turkish Republic. So I'm interested in this transition from empire to republic because it's a period that of course witnessed profound political and social change. And I'm interested in looking at how urban leisure spaces also change to reflect these political and social shifts, okay? And today I want to focus, you know, I can't obviously look at the full scope of my research. So I'm focusing on one case study, one site, an iconic site that's particularly symbolic of these changes and is also um, representative of the political struggles uh, that have taken place on, on the site, okay? It's the story of the site that's now Gizi Park and Taksim Square, situ situated in the heart of Istanbul. And of course, if any of you followed the headlines in the summer of 2013, Gizi Park became the site of a statewide um, uprising 
after the municipal leadership neglected to listen to the public's objections to the city's plans to rebuild a late Ottoman era military barracks over the site of their public park. And on the left, you see a, a historical photograph of this uh, military barracks. And on the right, you see uh, the, the public protests, the sit-ins that occurred in Gezi Park to prevent um, the destruction of the park, okay? Now, the barracks would have been rebuilt as a simulacra, right? A simulacra of the original building. It would have contained the appearance of the shell of the original building, but of course, it would not have been um, used as a military uh, barracks. It would have, it was actually, it would have been rebuilt to, to look like the old military barracks, but would have essentially functioned as an indoor shopping mall, okay? So this was a major misstep on the part of Turkey's political leadership, the Justice and Development Party, commonly referred to as the AKP. And the AKP was then in charge of the Istanbul municipality. It, it has since lost that the election and, and now um, the CHP is the head of the Istanbul municipality. And it was a misstep because the Gezi Park protests tr triggered a chain of other protests across the country against the AKP's authoritarian leadership. Why did Istanbul's munici municipal leadership take this misstep, which at that time was of course controlled by the AKP? Why did it want to uproot one of Istanbul's historic public parks and replace it with an Ottoman era military barracks that had been built in the late 18th century and destroyed in the early 1940s. What did the military barracks represent and how did its symbolism further this party's ideological framework? Well, for one, Turkey's current political leadership prioritizes the type of heritage preservation that can further their own claim to power and that can validate their political dominance. As they overhaul Istanbul to fuel their neoliberal agenda, and as they grow the city at an unsustainable rates of development, they prioritize preserving structures that are either carry religious significance, such as mosques, or which, you know, the mosques, of course, speak to the party's Islamist identity, or they prioritize structures that represent the strength, strength of the state, such as a military barracks, okay? Reconstructing a monument that pays tribute to the empire's military strength and commemorates the power that that state exercised over its subjects, sometimes through violence, is problematic. And reconstructing the symbol of the state's power also valorizes an authoritarian approach to governments and city planning that is at the heart of the AKP's neoliberal agenda. You know, these were all, of course, um, factors that um, the protesters were responding to. Okay. So, Taksim is a site that has carried tremendous significance since the founding of the Republic in 1923. It not only conveys and lends shape to the political identity of the city, but the square also lends shape to the identity of the nation as a whole. And control of the urban landscape in a highly visible site such as Taksim Square functions as a symbol of political control for the political party that happens to be in power at any one time, okay? And in a process that uncannily parallels what happened in the early years of the Turkish Republic, the AKP is opening up new spaces in the urban fabric that accord with its ideologies while it closes others that do not align with its values, its Islamist values. Taksim Square and Gezi Park were established as Istanbul's new urban nucleus after the formation of the secular Turkish Republic. Taksim was specifically chosen as a site that could serve as a new urban square in the 1920s because it did not contain any of the Ottoman Empire's religious monuments. Okay, it had, um, it had primarily been occupied by the Ottoman Empire's um, non-Muslim uh, religious minorities. So it did not have any mosques around the square, okay, that could lend that mosque an Islamic significance. Hence, it was chosen by the secular republic to become the new square of that republic, okay. Unlike a site such as Sultan Ahmed Square and the Hippodrome in the more historic uh, section of the city, and of course, on the left, you see an image of the Hagia Sophia, 
it's been in the news lately because again this is another site that's been transformed from it's used as a secular space it was designated as a secular space as a museum uh, with the founding of the Republic, shortly after the founding of the Republic, but the AKP has redesignated it as a, a mosque, okay? And of course, as you, I'm sure you know, it was originally not a mosque. It was originally a Byzantine monument built in the sixth century, but it was converted into a mosque after the conquest of Istanbul by the Ottoman Empire, right? And in the early years of the Republic, it was taken out of service as a mosque and designated as a museum, as a secular space, right? So now it's re-Islamicized uh, this structure, the Hagia Sophia, okay? And so in a way, the AKP's um, changing of public space and the, the, the uses of public space parallels what the Turkish Republic was doing in the 1920s and 30s, in the early years of the Republic, when it was trying to distance the Republic from its Ottoman and Islamist past and trying to secularize spaces in the urban fabric, the AKP is now doing the inverse, right? Taking those secular spaces and re-Islamicizing them, okay? So Taksim received its first uh, national symbol in 1928 with the construction of the Republican monument honoring Mustafa Kemal, uh, the National War of Independence and the founding of the New Republic. And here in this view right behind the monument, you see the Ottoman military barracks. It hasn't yet been um, knocked down in, in the late 1920s, early 1930s when this photograph would have been taken. Now, about a decade later, the military barracks would be torn down and the entire area next to Taksim Republican Square. And here, this is the area, this is the monument that I just showed you and this was the little square around it, okay? So this whole area, and this is where the military barracks would have been. So this whole area was redesigned and rebuilt in 1942 by urban planner, Henry Prust. And Henry Prust basically redesigned uh, Good, a good portion of the district of Beolu and incorporated this new urban square. It was referred to as the Inanu Esplanade and, and Park. And here's a little park next to it, okay? And this is the site that is now Gezi Park, okay? Just to give you a sense of the geography, okay? So, and in fact, after trying for decades since the Turkish president uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan served as the mayor of Istanbul in the 1990s, the AKP has trying to build, been build has been trying to build a mosque in this very secular space of uh, Taksim Square, and it recently finally succeeded in in doing that. So um, I haven't been to Istanbul in over a year, so I don't know what state of completion the mosque is in now. Um, but um, this was taken a couple of years ago. You could see there is now a massive Friday Congregational Mosque towering over um, the Taksim Republican Square, right? And the monument that I showed you would be right there. The monument is still here. The monument has not been knocked down. I mean that would that would cause a riot if that happened. Um, but, you know, this secular square has been Islamicized, okay? So it's my argument that heritage preservation should not stop at the restoration or reconstruction of religious or military structures that represent the authority and power of the state. You know, wh whichever party this power of the state belongs to, whether it's the AKP or the CHP, right? My argument is that it should also preserve sites of social and recreational activity where individual and collective histories have played out, okay? And here I wish to invoke uh, geographer and anthropologist David Harvey's definition of the right to the city. The right to the city is far more than the individual liberty to access urban resources. It's a right to change ourselves by changing the city. It is moreover a common rather than an individual right since this transformation inevitably depends upon the exercise of a collective power to reshape processes of urbanization, okay? So Harvey's basically saying that the city's residents' ability to actively play a role in shaping their city also affects their ability to shape themselves and their communities. Municipal leaders' vision of how their modernizing city should take shape did not always align with the vision 
visions of the city's various residents and publics. But its various publics and communities have in the past attempted to address those in power in such a way as to demand to be heard. By charting out a comparison between struggles to shape pub the Taksim area from past to present, here I will aim to show how historical patterns of dispossession have played out on the site, and also how ensuing patterns of dissent have been voiced to call out injustices and inequalities in shaping the urban sphere. Okay. The stories of those who've been dispossessed by the significant political shifts that have reshaped empires into nations that have redrawn borders and forcibly relocated populations are also inscribed into urban space. If we delve far enough into the past history of Taksim Square and Gizi Park, one that predates even the establishment of the Turkish Republic and reaches back into Ottoman history, it's possible to narrate this history in such a way that can call attention to those shifts, erasures and dispossessions, rather than burying them as though they were just piles of debris in Istanbul's frenetic construction boom. The square we refer to as Taksim carried other names in recent history. The municipal district of Beolo, where Taksim is located, used to be referred to as Para, which is actually a Greek word. Parts of Para had once been located on the outskirts of the city and were covered in graveyards designated for the, Ottomans, for the Ottoman Empire's various religious and ethnic populations. The Greeks, Armenians, the Levantines or Catholics, the Protestants, as well as, of course, the Muslims who made up the majority population of the Ottoman Empire all had graveyards in Para. An ethnic minority that's missing from this equation that didn't have a graveyard in Para is the city's Jewish population and the Jewish cemeteries would have been located closer to the Jewish uh, neighborhoods of the city, such as the neighborhood of Haske. So much to the delight of Orientalist travelers to the city who loved to write about them, the graveyards of Para also served as a popular recreation site and a promenade. It was a destination because uh, the high viewpoint of Para offered stunning vistas of the city's surrounding topography and coastlines. And here we see an Orientalist traveler having made a sketch of um, you know, people sitting on gravestones and enjoying the tremendous views of the Bosphorus as well as the, the shore. This is the European peninsula. This would be the Asian peninsula, right? And the Bosphorus cuts through um, the two peninsulas that make up the two sides of the city. Okay, so they're really enjoying, they're using, they're using the graveyard as a recreation site to enjoy the vistas, to, um, to engage in, in leisure. Okay. So it might seem contradictory to utilize a graveyard as a leisure site, but in reality, the graveyards of the city were lushly planted. They were tree lined and grass covered urban spaces. There were spaces that were used in the matter of city parks we think of today. There were places you would go to escape the crowds, lounge under the shade of trees, and to go on strolls and promenades. And, you know, for those of you who might be familiar with the history of urban parks in the United States, actually cemeteries were used in the United States as well in the early 19th century, early to mid 19th century before the first urban parks started to be built. So it wasn't uncommon to use cemeteries as a leisure site. However, the various epidemics that spread through Istanbul in the 1850s and 1860s, including various cholera outbreaks, made it unsanitary to use active graveyards as leisure and recreation sites. Some of the new urban gardens that were established a few years later were actually the direct outcome of efforts to improve urban sanitation on these graveyard promenades. The newly structured and centralizing municipality of Istanbul was introducing modernizing urban reforms at this time. These reforms introduced the notion of public benefit to municipal administration and gave the municipality greater authority to control the appearance and use of common areas such as city squares and streets and to seize private property under the pretext of serving the common good. In 1865, as part of these measures, the Department of Public Security prohibited burials within the city proper and convinced the religious foundations who had control over the cemeteries of Para to move their burial grounds to the further outskirts of the city. So they ended up moving to neighborhoods such as Pangalta and Shishli, okay? Which 
back then were the outskirts. And now, of course, the city has enveloped those neighborhoods as well. In 1870, the Catholic and Protestant cemeteries were expropriated by the municipality. And I don't know if everyone's familiar with that term expropriation, but it's a seizure of private land for, by the state, okay? And the Catholic and Protestant cemeteries, which you hear, see here, and this is the map showing the Ottoman military barracks right there. This is the Catholic cemetery, and this is the prominent uh, Protestant cemetery just to the north of the military barracks, okay? This, these, this, these two cemeteries, the, the municipality convinced the Catholics and the Protestants to move their cemeteries to Pongalta, where they, they're still located, okay? And it turned this site upon which these cemeteries were located into the, one of the first uh, public gardens of the city, the Tucson Municipal Garden, okay? And bourgeois and upper class factions of the public responded very favorably to the prospect of establishing these public gardens. And they were very much in demand by, by the upper echelons of society. And in fact, documents relating to the expropriation of these cemeteries mention that the establishment of a garden in their place was in demand by the community, in quotes. But there were also considerable objections voiced against the municipality's seizure, seizure of the graveyards. The proposal to establish the new people's gardens was an effective strategy on the city's part to pacify objections to the expropriations of the graveyards. And the creation of the Tucson Garden can be seen as an attempt to engage city residents in a process of negotiation as the municipality consolidated its power and imposed more control over the city's public and private spaces. So one of these objections came from the Armenian Orthodox community. Originally, the, the city wanted to build, um, it wanted to move its artillery field that you see right here in front of the mil military barracks. It wanted to move it to the north of the military barracks, to this whole area, to not only the land that covered the Catholic and Protestant cemetery, but also the land that covered the Armenian cemetery. Okay, why did it want to do this? Because there was another military institution, you can't see it in this map, but it's just situated just further north and it's Harbia, it's a military academy. So it wanted its artillery field to combine these two institutions, these military institutions. And in order to win support to do that, it said it would turn its old artillery field into a very large public garden. Now, when the Armenian Orthodox Church, of course, objected to the seizure of their land by the city, um, they refused to give up their cemetery, then the city could not move its artillery field to the north and it's kept it in its place, but it did have to resort to building the garden that it had already promised the public that it was going to build. build okay? Hence, the Tucson Garden was established here, okay? So, but the municipality didn't give up the effort to seize the Armenian cemetery, even after the park was established in 1870. Two years later, in 1872, it tried to take over the Armenian cemetery again. And this time in response, the Armenian patriarch rallied his community in protest and had 100 Armenian clergymen and 1,500 Armenian Ottoman subjects visit the palace of Sultan Abdul Aziz to petition him with protests. They claimed that their cemetery was a holy site of pilgrimage and that the government would violate their spiritual rights if it took this land. Several of the petitioners also camped out in the cemetery, erected tents with crosses on them, and kept watch over this land to ensure that it wouldn't be taken away. They were once again successful in preserving their cemetery, at least for the time being. So if we look at this insurance map drawn by Jacques Pervitich in 1925, two years after the founding of the Republic, we see here the Tucson Garden. Okay, we see a very nice layout of the Tucson Garden. It's actually one of the nicest maps of the garden that we have. We see that the military barracks is still in place. The artillery field is still here. And the cemetery is also here, the Armenian cemetery. So over the 50 years, 55 or so years since the founding of the garden, it wouldn't have changed. This landscape would not have changed that much up until 1925, okay? Um, this map would change drastically a couple decades later with the replanning of the entire Tucson area. 
Pervitage's map offers us a good idea of the confines of the original garden. Um, and we see that its landscaping takes as its inspiration the new houseman style Parisian parks that were designed in the English style. It has these wooded walkways, these winding promenades, okay? Um, and English style refers to parks that were designed to have a more organic, uh, natural look rather than the straight axes of the traditional French parks. And I show you this picture, this is a before and after view of the French park Bois de Boulogne. Um, that was turned into, it was a royal hunting ground that was then turned into a public park under Emperor Louis Napoleon in uh, 1852. And here you see a before view of the park and here you see an after. And Napoleon wanted these kind of, um, these very straight axial uh, sight lines and pathways of the royal hunting grounds to turn into a more natural organic looking park that would be modeled after the English style garden, the English style park. So in essence, what the Turkish, um, what the Ottoman era public gardens are trying to do is that they're taking inspiration from French public parks that themselves are looking at English public parks, right? So it's various levels of um, inspiration. And in fact, it would have been a French gardener um, and a French botanist um, by the name of Dehuan who would have, um, landscape this park, okay? And he, he became the gardener of Sultan Abdul Hamid several years later. So he was a Frenchman building in the English style, okay? So what else do we see in this map? We see that there are buildings, there's a cinema, there's a theater, um, there is a buffet, a cafe, a bar, and an orchestra, a band shell, right? So we see certain structures that signify different forms of leisure and our entertainment that are creeping into these spaces that are changing the way the Ottomans are engaging in leisure activities um, in these spaces, okay? And I've set up contrasts between two sets of images here to show, in a way to show you some of the changes that occurred when Ottomans started leaving their more traditional leisure grounds and recreation grounds and entering the space of these new public gardens, okay? Um, we see that their behaviors changed, their activities changed, and these sites played a significant role actually in social engineering and changing society to accord with the modernizing changes that were affecting the urban layout of the city. Um, written accounts of the new Tuxen People's Garden reveal it to be a space that was more segregated by class, gender, and ethnicity than the graveyard promenades of Para. The cemeteries of the Grand Champ de Mort, in contrast, were free of charge, and they were accessible to a broader cross-section of the public, at least on certain designated days of the week. There were still some um, prohibitions as to what days of the week uh, Muslim women could visit the Ottoman Empire's leisure sites, okay, because they didn't want the Muslim women to be intermingling with other segments of the society, okay. And as bourgeois and upper class members of Ottoman society emerged into visibility within these new public gardens, and here we see one of the rare views, there aren't that many views of the interior of the Tuxen public garden um, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. This is one of the rare views. Um, we see that as they emerge into the view in these sites, and it was definitely a site w where people went to see and be seen, to show off their latest fashions, to show off their latest possessions, um, the, the poor disappeared from view in these sites, okay? Because these were gated, gated sites that you had to pay an entry fee to get into. And you ostensibly also had to pay to sit at the cafe tables and to consume beverages and food, right? So you actually had to had money in order to inhabit these sites, right? That wasn't necessarily the case in the cemeteries. Here I see, um, I, sh I have another before after view. Here we have a view of um, riverbank, Kyatane populated by some picnickers, right? And here again, we have the view of the Toxin Garden. And, you know, there are certainly quite a few differences in the way these visitors are using the site, right? These women are picnicking on the ground. Um, these women are strolling on the promenade, right? So if we, if we think of um, 
differences in leisure time in between these two sites. The idea of someone picnicking on the ground suggests that maybe they're engaging in a slower uh, experience of leisure time, right? They could picnic here over the course of several hours, whereas someone who's strolling the promenade suggests a faster experience of leisure time, right? A faster experience of modernity, okay? Um, we also see that there is a more consumerist mode of recreation, of course, inside the garden, right? Evidenced by the cafe tables, by the orchestra, by the theater, okay? There are also, there are differences here, but there are also some similarities. I mean, we shouldn't assume that either of these spaces offered a total freedom of access and mobility, especially not to women and especially not to Muslim women. You know, and here we see Muslim women picnicking on the grounds of the Kyatane uh, River riverbank, right? But we don't see any Muslim women in the space of the Taksim Garden. You know, we see women who are dressed very much in Western fashions, and these would have been women who belong to the empire's minority communities, the Armenians, the Greeks, the Jews, the Levantines, okay? There are really no accounts of Muslim women occupying the space inside the Taksim Garden until 1914, until new rules would be passed that would allow Muslim women to intermingle freely, to stroll next to Muslim men in these city parks, okay? So, but then again, this space is also segregated. I mean, we see women, Muslim women occupying this space, but they're not sitting next to the men, right? It would have been discouraged to have women sitting next to men, even if they belong to the same family. So there are actually divisions in both of these spaces. I'm not trying to say that one space was a space of complete integration between all of these various gendered, ethnic and class divisions and the other one um, you know, upheld these divisions. There are divisions in both spaces, but I would say that the space of the gardens upheld those divisions a bit more than the space of the meadows, okay? At least until 1942, when laws were passed that would permit Muslim men and women to occupy the gardens together, okay? And before 1914, there are accounts of Muslim women's objections to being barred from sites such as the pub Taksim Public Garden. A wartime editorial published in the Ottoman women's magazine, Kadınlar Dünyası, or Women's World, demands access to the Taksim Garden, starting with the phrase, we hear from our men that, and repeating that phrase over and over again to offer a full list of the various benefits of visiting the Taksim Garden. The author complains that she's been denied these benefits that have been uh, granted to her to her um, male counterparts, okay? And for this writer, gaining access to the city and its urban semi-public spaces becomes a measure of equality. And her editorial can be read as a demand to remedy her inequality. City officials may have been responding to similar demands when they established the Gülhane Public Garden on the grounds of the Topkapı Palace in 1914. This garden was not only free of charge, but it also permitted Muslim men and women to stroll together. A newspaper article written about this new measure explains that a civilized society is one in which women and men can occupy the same leisure grounds. From the 1870s to the 1910s, we repeatedly see the way in which urban space is shaped and used serve, serving as an important marker of concepts of civility or being civilized. But what kinds of behavior constituted civilized behavior appears to have changed from the 1870s through the 1910s, especially in regard to what types of behavior was deemed to be appropriate for Muslim women. So these types of, I also wanna say that even though mayor of the time of Istanbul, Cemil Topuzlu, he did um, desegregate uh, genders in, uh, in the space of the urban park. He also imposed all of these other restrictions and all of these other rules on how the public should actually inhabit the space of the public garden, okay? And here's a list of some of those rules. And he really, I mean, when you read these rules, you get the sense that he was really trying to use the space of the public garden as a tool of social engineering, 
as a tool through which to shape public behavior, right? And to shape the behavior of urban residents. He says, you know, you have to walk on the right hand side of the paths, you know, so that you can let other people pass you on the left, you know, pass them on the right. No poster solicitations, no tampering, no graffiti, dogs off leash will be confiscated, no street vendors, no shoe blacks, no begging, no littering, no stepping or sitting on the grass. You know, I mean, when we think of the way we inhabit uh, a public space today, of course, we, we like sitting on the, the lawn, right? This was not allowed in the new the public gardens of Istanbul. And actually Olmsted himself tried to prohibit uh, visitors sitting on the lawns of his urban parks, right? As you know, Olmsted is a designer of uh, Central Park, but of course it didn't stick. People wanted to sit on the grass. That was whole, the whole point of going to the park, right? So we see a very draconian uh, approach to shaping public behavior. I mean, even though uh, the gender segregation has become more lenient. There are other rules that are being imposed on the public here by Jimmy Tofuzlo in his uh, rules and regulations. And these rules would have been posted throughout all of the parks of Istanbul, all of the public gardens. So the social changes occurring gradually over the course of the late Ottoman Empire's modernization were more drastically implemented after the transition to the secular Turkish Republic in 1923. And they were implemented from the top down, from the heads of state to the people. Although there were efforts on the part of the Turkish leadership to establish a greater degree of gender and class equality, among the citizens of the Turkish Republic, the nationalist ideologies that were propagated under Republican rule led to new divisions and new injustices that are tied to the history of the establishment of Taksim Square in Gezi Park. Borders were not only redrawn in the transition from the Ottoman Empire to the Turkish Republic, but populations were also forced to relocate across these new borders. And in order to placate this tremendous demographic upheaval, an effort was made to graft a newly defined social homogenization onto the urban landscape as well as upon the populace of the city. A Turkish cultural identity, one that was overtly secular, came to replace the bygone religious and ethnic diversity of the Ottoman Empire. After the massacres and expulsion of much of the Ottoman Armenian population in 1915, and after the population exchange between Greece and Turkey, which displaced most of Anatolia's Ottoman Greek population in 1923, much of the property of the departing Greek and Armenian communities was expropriated in order to have this property benefit the citizens of the new Turkish Republic. The spaces of Taksim Square and Gezi Park were themselves shaped through similar processes of dispossession of the state's religious minorities. The Ottoman military barracks, the Taksim Municipal Garden, and the Serp Agap Cemetery that you saw in Pravitic's map, and here we have a view of the cemetery, the Armenian cemetery, would be swept away with Taksim's transformation through urban planner Henry Prost's new master plan of Beolo. Prost's master plan for Istanbul was approved in 1939, the same year that the municipality was finally able to see the Serp Agop Armenian Cemetery through extra legal measures that delegitimized the Armen Armenian patriarchs and the Armenian community's rightful ownership of these lands. Responding to then Mayor Lutfi Kurdas, Kurdar's wish to have a space where crowds could gather for national holidays, ceremonies, and parades, Prost designs the Inanu Esplanade and the park next to the Republican monument. And this became a space where the project of promoting a sense of national unity could be practiced and implemented. And of course, this is the site that is now occupied by Gizzi Park. Now, one of the remarkable developments of the Gezi Park protests of 2013 was the fact that it conjured the ghosts of the cemetery and narrated the history of its confiscation, thereby giving visibility to the Armenian community once again. A young group of Armenian protesters referring to themselves as Nor Zartonk took part in the occupation of Gezi Park in the summer of 2013, along with many other groups that were also occupying this park at the same time, by erecting styrofoam gravestones stating, you took our cemetery, you won't have our park. 
They called attention to the fact that Gizzi Park came into formation through their own community's history of dispossession. Now, even though Gizzi Park's footprint does not encompass the former grounds of the Serp Agop Cemetery, Gizzi Park ends here and the cemetery starts there. Uh, even though it doesn't encompass it, Norzar Tuck's presence at the Gezi protests did allow all of the park's occupiers, right, the nationalists included, regardless of political affiliation, to see a historical cycle of displacement and dispossession, as well as a historical cycle of dissent in response to the government's overreach into the spaces and lives of city residents. So, I've narrated this history of a recreation site that was turned into um, a park in a grassroots manner, okay? The, the site that was a graveyard actually became a recreation site through public use, okay? And it was through the public's demand that they ha still have a recreation site once the, the graveyards were being expropriated that's what caused the municipality to create one of the first public gardens of Istanbul to begin with. So it was really through public use that this site came into being, okay? And another thing that's, I think that's very significant that it grew out of public use as opposed to being a site that was designated from the top down as, as a site for public recreation. I also think that what's significant about the site as well as some of Istanbul's other still extant public gardens is the way in which members of the public responded to the way in which the site was being transformed by government entities over the course of political shifts. The fact that the land upon which Gizzi Park sits has served as a site of contestation between civic and state actors, I believe lends it added importance as a political and social space that should be claimed for and by the people and preserved as a site of cultural heritage. Now in an ideal world, these sites, these gardens and parks would also display commemorative marker, markers that signify their contentious and at times their violent histories markers that would speak about the Serp Agop Armenian Cemetery that lies buried underground, for example, or markers that honor the young men who lost their lives during the Gezi protests due to police brutality. But those, for those of you who are familiar with the troubled history of public arts and public monuments in Turkey, you know that any monument that doesn't necessarily accord with mainstream nationalist ideologies of the state becomes a target of man vandalism. And you know this is not a, an exception. We're certainly dealing with vandalism of public monuments in this country as well. And I'm not only talking about the Confederate statues. I mean, I wanna cite the example of the monument to Frederick Douglass in Rochester that was toppled uh, last 4th of July, okay? So these monuments become uh, sites where social divisions and public divisions are being acted out. So perhaps in the meanwhile, the more temporary actions and makeshift monuments, such as those of Norzartank, uh, the Norzartank protesters are going to have to speak on behalf of the silenced histories uh, that we are not hearing about for now. Uh, I, that, that's the end of my talk. I'd be happy to take questions. And how am I on time, Leah? You're right on time. Great. Some questions. Okay, good. Thanks, Bryn. Should I start so sharing my screen? Yeah, you could. Well, actually, I, I would say leave it on in case someone okay. wants to look at an image again, and they'll be able to see it a little bit larger. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, there's, I, I should point out again that if you're on here, if you have a question, please type it into the chat or um, Leah, I forget, can they unmute themselves? I will allow them to unmute themselves now. That would be great. And yeah, if you want to, you can just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask a question. Before you ask a question, I forgot. I, I promised the editors of the volume in which um, the article that I took a lot of this content <laughs> from, I promised them that I would promote their volume. So um, 
you know, if you want to read more about the, 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 the history of the site that I've talked about today and other ways of commenting the city, I encourage you to um, get this volume, Commenting the City, Empirical Perspectives on Urban Ecology, Economics, and Ethics. There are lots of good articles in this edited volume. Okay. I did my part. Hey, Baron. I have a question for you. Hi, Jordan. How are you? I'm very well. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for the lecture. So a lot of this is new material to me, but I was fascinated by the way that public spaces have often been in active transition from the top. And I'm wondering if there's any more information to relate, aside from the protests that you covered at the very end there, for like the public's flexibility in adopting a new purpose or meaning for a public space, like when it had been religiously charged and then it was secularized or when a graveyard was made into a leisure space. Is there any more you can relate about how quickly or a, a public might adopt a new purpose or fight against it? Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, there's so much division in Turkish society right now. So it's really hard to even, um, you know, categorize the Turkish public as one public. There are so many different publics, right? There are so many divisions. There are still lots of ethnic divisions. There are new waves of refugees coming into the city, right? And they're um, being faced with a lot of discrimination uh, by populations that have occupied the city, lived in the city for longer periods of time. So it's so hard to, to like designate one specific public but of course, like all of these communities have their own spaces in the city and open up their own spaces in the city. Um, I'm trying to think of some good examples. I mean, the thing is uh, the migrants and the refugees, I mean, the various different publics that have flooded into Istanbul. And the other thing about Istanbul is it, its population is changing so rapidly, right? It continues to grow, right? So the new spaces are, are opened up by these new publics that are coming into the city, right? The question is whether or not there's there's tolerance for this level of difference. You know, there's certainly a lot of difference within the population of Istanbul itself. And one of the factors that makes Istanbul such a fascinating place is that there are so many publics coexisting with an urban space there. Is there tolerance between one community of, or another? I mean, that's that's another that's a question, right? That's the question worth asking. And, you know, this all, of course, then uh, comes into conflict with the municipal leaderships or the, the national leaderships, um, neoliberal agenda, you know, it's constantly trying to lay claim to more land, to, to build more, to gentrify space more. There's a lot of gentrification happening, right? A lot of these poorer communities are being pushed to the outskirts of the city. So it's really hard to, to answer that. I'm sorry, I can't come up with one other specific example. Can you, can you ask a more, can you ask your question in a more pointed way? I mean, can you maybe give an example of something you've seen in San Francisco that points to what you're trying to illustrate? So I, I can't think of a specific example that might make my question clearer, but I'm just thinking like if a space had previously been religiously charged and now it's gonna be secularized and you're right, obviously use the word public as a general is pretty frustrating because you've obviously like different factions and you might have some part of the community that is welcoming of a place becoming a secular space and you might have a certain part of the community that resists that change and I was just wondering if I guess if there were any examples of people saying well we're going to try to continue to claim this space as a religious site even if we're being told that it's now going to be used for something else or as a religious site well first of all I mean I, I don't think it would I don't think the political landscape of Turkey would allow for a religious site to become secularized today I just don't think that would be possible. Yeah. Or when a graveyard might be come up like a leisure space. I'm interested in that history. I know you, you mentioned that in the United States that there's also a parallel there. Now today we, we don't treat graveyards here as like sacred spaces as much as we treat them as spaces that are just kind of off limits. And then there's the whole like mythologizing of uh, the phantasmagoric side of graveyards. And so I'm interested in when it was actually just used as a leisure space 
Um, and I don't know if you have any information or any anecdotes to relate about that, because that's that's a much different way to use a graveyard to think of it as like a Sunday stroll space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you know, there are other graveyards that were covered over and turned into public gardens. Um, the Muslim graveyard of Galeta was covered over. And there weren't that many objections posed, you know, I think it had to do more with whether or not that graveyard was being actively used and perhaps an older graveyard had fallen out of use, right? Um, it's interesting, I mean, the graveyards today, there's still some significantly large graveyards in Istanbul, but <laughs> because there's such this demand to claim new space to build upon, right? Because so much of Turkey's GDP is based in the construction sector. So, you know, there's always this desire to locate new land, undeveloped land to build upon. So, I mean, even those longstanding Muslim cemeteries that, um, you know, have been part of the urban fabric for centuries, I think they themselves are probably in danger of being whittled away. You know, you wouldn't be, I mean, you wouldn't drop an apartment complex on top of like the Karaja Ahmed Cemetery in Üsküdar, but those cemeteries are also shrinking. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. I hope I was able to answer your question. Stephanie, yes. I see you have a question. Um, you're raising your hand. I think you can unmute yourself. There you go. but we can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry, I keep forgetting that the microphone on my computer doesn't work. <laughs> there we go. There we go. So each of these, um, you know, the iterations of these, you know, public spaces, which don't actually then serve all of the publics, right, which is really interesting. You know, they, they serve diff different populations under the, the guise of being public spaces. Would you identify one version of these that felt more inclusive than another? Or are, are there any spaces throughout Istanbul that were actually for the public and the way, I guess it's very much an, a, you know, a cultural lens that I'm, I'm looking through here, right? Of my, my own, our own ex cultural experience with public spaces. Um, but do you think that one of these served the public better than another? Well, it's interesting. No, I don't think they did. I don't think any of them were truly public. And in my article, I make the argument that maybe the experiment of the Gezi Park protests temporarily created the space, this true space of inclusivity, right? That you could be welcomed in regardless of your affiliation, regardless of your class, regardless of your beliefs, right? And you know, I make the argument that it was a temporary experiment that, that experimented with what true public space could really be. Um, but you know, I actually, unfortunately, I had like a fellowship uh, at the time that the Gezi protests were happening. And so I wasn't able to be in Istanbul. I was in Los Angeles at the time. And I got to Istanbul right at the end of June. You know, by then the park had been emptied out of the protesters. So I actually never camped out on the park. I never, you know, did a sit-in at the park. The park was already emptied out by the time I got to Istanbul. So, um, you know, I wasn't able to witness that firsthand. Um, but from what I've heard from other friends who actually did camp out at the park and who did participate in the sit-in, that, that it was this incredible sense of inclusiveness. Um, and there wasn't, an there wasn't total agreement, of course, you know, but it was a space in which people of differing opinions could come and, and, and hear one another, which was a really very interesting experiment. Great. I don't know, is there anyone here who was actually in Gezi Park in June of 2013, late May. Laura? No? Okay. I mean, um, yeah. Uh, Biren, thank you so much for this brilliant presentation. Um, one thing that I would pose as a comment to you would be, uh, pose as a question to you would be uh, how, 
you say that you don't necessarily designate either space as fully public. And yet I think the, the reason its publicness became so pronounced during the Giza Park protest bec was because the counter threat was full on privatization. I mean, they were going to build military barracks, but those military barracks were supposed to become a mall. Um, and, you know, this is part of the problem with Istanbul is that you can't sit anywhere without necessarily spending money. You can't sit without having tea or buying water for five lira or, you know, whatever. Uh, so I, I wonder how this public private um, scale can be uh, expanded upon a little more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I think that would pertain very much to New York City. You know, it's very hard for me walking around New York City to find a place that I can actually sit for a couple of hours without spending money, right? It's just, I mean, I think this is the neoliberal reality of the neoliberal city, right? It's like completely privatized. There's really like this complete erosion of public space. And so what do you do? Um, I think right now what we have at our disposal are, are acts perhaps acts of commoning that we can engage in to try and make a space a little more public right than it actually is maybe you you know maybe you you do something in a plaza in manhattan that normally would not be condoned you know you engage in acts of commoning in order to assert your right to be able to use a space as the way you'd want it you'd want to be able to use as opposed to the way it's been designed or designated to be used which of course al aligns with um systems of capital you know but you know i do see i do see spaces in istanbul being used in such an improvisational manner um, and that gives me hope. I do see people putting chairs out on the sidewalk, you know, where you normally wouldn't have chairs in order to create this space of engagement with one another, right? I mean, you know, I haven't been to Istanbul since COVID, but I'm imagining this is happening more and more outdoors, right? When people can't come together inside. So um, there, there is, I do believe in the uh urban residents ability to use space in an improvisational way in order to to make it accord more with their notions of of how public space should serve them i guess i have a question if i may if as long as nobody else is ready to jump in uh we have a lot of senior students here tonight and uh, they're all either wrapping up their senior thesis project or they're getting it underway and I wondered uh, if you could talk a little bit about what kind of challenges you encountered in your research what were some of the things what were some of the obstacles you faced in doing the, all of this research well thank you for that uh, first of all I want to thank the American Research Institute in uh, Turkey and the National Endowment for the humanities to, for giving me a grant that actually allowed me to um, be in Istanbul for a significant amount of time. Because when you talk about space, you have to go and visit these spaces, right? I actually went and did field work. I sat at these public parks and took notes on how people were actually using these spaces. And I wouldn't have really had the funds or the means to do that without getting that fellowship. So um, it helps to have funds. Um, but <coughs> it's interesting. Um, well, I don't really know the nature of their projects, so I, I can't give very specific advice on um, how to move ahead in the research. But um, well, obviously, one of the challenges that I encounter is that I'm here in upstate New York and my research materials, you know, the spaces that I study are on the other side of the world. That's a major challenge. And COVID of course has 
put a wrench in my ability to actually go and visit these spaces in person, right? That's a problem. However, the librarians at my institution have been very helpful. So at least they're helping me get materials and books that helps me find writings about um, historical narratives about these sites so that even though I can't go and visit them in person right now, I still have access to um, materials that I can read about their history. So I would encourage you to hit up your librarians. They've been very helpful for me thus far. Thank you. Okay. Other questions that people have? I had a question about um, audiences or publics. I mean, we're talking about public spaces. And I was thinking when you started your presentation, um, you were looking at the mosque that is now being built um, in Taksim. Um, and, you know, we're talking about the military barracks. So, so who are the intended publics for that sort of state performance? Um, and do you think that um, the, the target audiences are the ones that are actually getting, um, that are responding most to what's happening? Or, or would you say that the, the target audience and the actual audience of like these state performances of authority are different? That's a great question, Camelia. I think that it's, it's a publicity stunt. I mean, I think it functions on multiple different levels. I mean, of course, um, it serves uh, communities within the city. Um, it serves as a tourist destination for um, groups of religious tourists and helps draw them to uh, Istanbul. Certainly, um, you know, fl flown into Istanbul recently, you see groups of um, religious tourists coming to the city. Um, it acts as a publicity stunt, right, to show that, um, to show the AKP dominance um, in the urban sphere, to show that its, uh, its political strength is not diminishing, right, even though we know in truth that the party is having some issues right now, right, I mean, they, they lost the vote in three of the major cities in Turkey a couple of years ago, so uh, I think it functions on multiple different levels. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good question. You see a tension now between, I think you mentioned this a little bit, um, you know, after these municipal elections, especially in Istanbul, um, with the mayor of Istanbul, like not being a, an AKP like member. So, so is there a tension now that you see between like that sort of like national narrative and, and the municipal power? Um, in Istanbul. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, yeah, we certainly, I mean, there, there are a lot of divisions and uh, the, the mayor of Istanbul, he's, you know, he's, he's been uh, trying to instate a lot of changes, but of course, um, there, there are limits to what he can do, right, within his sphere of authority. And his sphere of authority is constantly being curtailed by um, the national government. I saw a raised hand out there. Someone else had a question, I believe. Yeah, I do. This is Fidi de Arcu. I'm calling from St. Paul, Minnesota. Oh, hi, Fidi really, de. Hi, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. At the beginning, I, I had to get away a little bit, someone called. But anyway, you talked about the, some of the, in some cities outside, outside of Istanbul, having millet bachelor at one time. Yeah, and they did. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to follow up on that. Which cities, for example? So many cities, Firide. Oh my goodness, so many. Well, of course, Izmir, uh, uh, Antep, Ankara, Edirne, uh, Diyarbakir even, um, Adana, Konya, Trabzon, Mersin. I can go on. I have a list somewhere. 
but very many, many, many cities. And this was, they weren't just cities in Anatolia, they were cities in the Balkans as well, Thessaloniki, Ishkodra, um, Kavala, you know, so many, so many cities. And of course, across the Mediterranean, Beirut, um, Tripoli, um, mm -hmm. Jerusalem. Yep. Most of them built under Sultan Abdul Hamid. And of course, I oh, wish same. I wish that my life was long enough to be able to study the history of all of these Milet uh, mm -hmm. in all of these cities. It would be so wonderful. But um, I had to I had to limit my research to Istanbul. I think that's that's uh, yeah. enough of an undertaking. Mm -hmm. But slowly, mm -hmm. I'm I'm starting to unearth uh, information about all these Milet They're all they're very yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was it was part of it was part of the whole um, centralization of the government, right? Trying to yeah institute institute all of these municipal reforms and then institute them in in other major cities in the Ottoman Empire, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, they followed the province reforms of the eighteen sixties as well. So yeah, yeah it's it's yeah. an endless You're it's an right. endless okay. subject. It's an endless subject. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Other questions that you can either unmute yourself and go ahead and ask, or if you feel more comfortable, you can type your question into the chat. Well, it is coming up on 10 minutes after seven. I'll take this opportunity to thank Dr. Golanu again for joining us this evening and uh, the presentation on your fascinating research. Thank you for being part of our series this fall. And I want to thank everyone else for coming this evening. If you have questions for Dr. Golanu, I think you can contact any of us, any of your professors, and we can relay those questions on to her. Does that sound good to you, Dr. Golanu? Sure, I'd be happy okay. to. I'd, I'd be happy to continue the conversations. So thanks everyone. <laughs>